try to say it a little more um, simply sometimes. But we're not, um, this isn't going to be a boring programming class. That's the good news. It's going to be <laughs> how to use scripts and how to adjust them and how to make them behave, you know. And also an opportunity to share stuff so for our classes so we are stronger when we're working with students who are creating projects, right? Great. That's awesome. I'm teaching Java right now and uh, at the community colleges and to mostly folks who are new to programming. So I'm really teaching introduction to programming. But I'm really not going to get into all of that today. Uh, I wasn't going to because some educators are, they, they want to be able to script, they just don't want to have to learn programming, right? <laughs> <laughs> so we usually think of the practical, you know, how would we use this and how can we do it automatically and how can we get back to the business of teaching, right? Well, I see it's time. Uh, welcome yeah. everyone. Let me make sure I'm in the local chat and I'll shut down a few of my extra chat so if you're messaging me in the background please feel welcome to do so but I'm cutting down I have 20 chats open right there we go welcome to get started let's see let me start with the slides I was looking at you guys <laughs> there we go Hi, I am Lear Lobo, also known as Dr. Cynthia Colloin. Let me run a test to see if someone cannot hear. Can anyone not hear me? A little sound check. I have, um, hey Agile Bill, I have descriptive slides, which is rare for me, right? Because I'm normally image heavy uh, for the hearing impaired and also for later, right? <laughs> to, to remember better. Okay, then I'll stop typing. Great. Just nice to check. All right. Well, we're in Vesuvius, and uh, this is um, this site was donated to us by Franz Charming and uh, Rhiannon Chetnoir, who's community manager for the nonprofit Commons, but also with the Vesuvius group. Welcome everyone, and please feel welcome to type in the text chat if you have a question, to ask me a question, etc. That's an eerie slide, isn't it? Sitting in front of the steps there. Um, <laughs> and here I better face forward. Um, I'm gonna, I have some gifts for you, and I'm going to stand for a moment to make it easier for you to get them. And of course, the main gift is here in the book. And this is going to illustrate, I want you to click my book, but we really need to do it just a couple of us at a time. If we all click it at the same time, we're not all going to be serviced, are we? Uh, so click it, and if you, it should give you a copy of the book. And it has all the scripts in it. It has textures in it. It has a copy of the viewer behind me. So you'll have my entire course for today. This is a very simple course, so this is for you, for your classes and your future work, or to give out to your students. It's full permission, and I don't know, uh, inside, uh, the, and it's giving you a folder. You'll see the folder name in the chat, and it's whispering it to you, so not everyone's seeing that, only you are. You're welcome. That was really my intent for having the session, so I guess we're done, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> So now we're going to talk about how to use these materials, right? Um, what's funny about this book is I created it for the 2015 Second Life birthday. And I wrote a little short story, and it's a silly farce, you know, one of these um, sword and sorcery kinds of things. And it's on the two pages in front of me. So I took the text from my uh, Word document, created images out of them, put it on here. I see the book in front of me, stranger, and then uh, let's see what I called it so you can find it. The name of it is, the folder name will be called Lear Lobo's Scripting Materials Book. 
After you get it, you can rename your folder to whatever you want, but I knew I could remember my name. You know what I mean? <laughs> so that's why I began with Lear Lobo's scripting materials book. Okay? But you can change the folder name, and almost everything in there should be modifiable. Everything should be. Um, I've set them all to modify, so when you res them on the ground, they will be modifiable. If ever something isn't, and I don't think that's the case in this case, but every once in a while we use a pose or we'll use something from another creator who will set it to no mod, right? Uh, my work is always modifiable, so there we are. And next week we're going to do resers, so uh, this is kind of a warm up for next week too. Good, good. Thank you, Torgon. I appreciate it. So let's see. Well, inside our contents, just so you know, I have a note there that says the scripts are set to not running. So if you ever use them, you have to open them and click the little running and mono boxes, just so you know, in the lower left corner. I have an auto script signed to res, and, and uh, that's just the sign with the auto script link. And we're going to talk about that today. We're going to look at the history of that too. And some of you live that history, so it's really your story. And then, uh, <laughs> then you have signs that look at all the different kinds of scripts. You have the scripts to peek at them yourself. You have two copies of this book inside the folder of book. One has all these contents, right? Uh, it's the exact same as what I'm wearing. And the other that just says, Lear Lobo's book, Castle Leomsa, inside your folder, uh, and add. You just add it to your outfit. It won't replace any of your prims or lose your mesh or whatever. And it's going to attach to your right hip, in case you're wondering. And it'll look like mine, right? <laughs> and I'm actually peeking inside the book to, to read this off to you. And then, of course, the scripting assistant is going to res the auto script. So that way you won't have to worry about, where did I put that? You can always put your own objects in there to res your content or change the sign from Autoscript to something you love, change the URL to a website you love, and, and tailor all of this work. Okay? Um, so let's get started. Let's see. Okay, so this is just going over some of the gifts we have today. and. You know, I hate, I hate staying distant from an audience. I don't know if you knew that. I, um, in the classroom, I'm usually the person who sits in the middle or the back and talks. So we're just going to put the slides there, right? And of course, to keep me from spinning around, I have to keep moving around, right? Showing my mad con con controls here. Everyone can still see this, right? I'll raise it up just a little in case. Okay. So you have a wearable book. You have uh, one with my tail. And no, I'm not going around selling my books yet. But I'm trying to get warmed up to the notion that people will read my stuff. I mean, I've written and published 30 scholarly papers, two books, and two book chapters. But I keep looking at it like, well, that was on for deadline, or that was for targeted audiences, or those are people who love that stuff, right? Uh, when you write fiction, it's a whole new ball game. <laughs> So you have to kind of get warmed up. So that's why I gave that to you. It's a silly thing. Okay, we're going to talk about the power of creation today. And what's interesting about the power of creation is the fact that why we're here. Why aren't we in one of the other worlds, which looks very cool, right? Sansar, uh, sine wave, high fidelity. Each of them have their strengths. The reason I'm not there... I have beta tested some of them, and, and uh, or alpha tested too, but the reason I'm not there with my classes yet is because I need students to be able to create content in just a few minutes and not have to have mad mesh skills, right? <laughs> they have to be able to drop a prim on the ground and make things happen and have it transform them in some way. They need to be able to predict object behavior. In other words, when we put a script on an object, we want to know what it's going to do. We don't want our scripts misbehaving on us, right? <laughs> so while uh, we think about these things, can everyone see that? If your camera skills are still uh, coming up to snuff and you're, you're using a Windows machine, hold down your Alt key and left click the viewer and then scroll in, right? 
That's what I love about these worlds is you have the best seat in the house. Even if I'm standing in front of the content, you can move around my body and go right past me. <laughs> so this is why we're here, right? Now, whether you agree with the learning pyramid or not, and of course, the poor folks at the National Training Laboratories lost a lot of their early data, right? So we, so many of those early records are lost, but we still retain the memory of the study. And the study, if, if, if you don't recall, told us that, um, oh, someone's asking for a teleport. Let me check the chat just real quick. There we go. Let me make sure she got it. There we go. Um, it's the notion that how much do students remember 24 hours later? If I do all the talking today and you do not talk, you do not type, or you do not tell me what you're thinking, how much will you remember 24 hours from now? Someone, give me a number. Any number will do. Usual. Yes, than usual. Any number will do. Give me a number from 1 to 100. Think in terms of fives. How much we remember if I do all the talking today? Just type a number in. Oh, you guys are high. Agile, Bill, Maggie. If I do all the talking, you'll remember 30%. Maggie, you're awesome. Ra got it. 5%. If I do all the talking today, you're going to remember 5%. I know. And no matter how entertaining I am, I know. Ra can read. <laughs> That's right, Eugenia, you're very close. But, but what you have to realize is this, was, this study was done, as I recall, I read the early work decades ago, right? <laughs> it's embarrassing to say when. But, but um, this notion that with 18 and 19-year-olds who are, who are taking a class they love, how much will they remember 24 hours later? And it was 5%. They'll remember that the experience was fun. They'll remember that it was engaging. Hey, we sat in a volcano, right? <laughs> but they won't remember the details. And one of our goals as educators is to up the number, right? We want to increase the number. We want them to remember and to use and to create and to apply. So we think about these things. So we're working down the pyramid. So, so we're not doing a lecture style today. <laughs> this is why you have all of the materials. You are now the teacher. You could be wearing your book if you so desired. You just add it to outfit, right click and add. And uh, when you, uh, you don't have to wear your book, though. Uh, in fact, it might lag you a little, right, at first. But um, the thing to realize is, if I get you to talking today, how much will you remember 24 hours later? And then I'll move on to the scripting, I promise. <laughs> Someone give me a number. And you know, if you give me the wrong number, you remember even better. Did you know that? So I encourage my students to be wrong. What a strange thought. You, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, there's some mad woman up here who's teaching her students to be wrong. They're wallowing in their wrongness. That's because wrongness creates a little emotion. It creates discomfort. And when we're uncomfortable, we remember. Yeah. Maggie got it this time. She's studying the chart. <laughs> Bethany, you probably do remember 60%. But, but the study showed that we remembered 50% if we discuss. And this is why in online learning, we encourage students to write and to discuss, right? The discussion board is, is king. And so when we're in the virtual world, I always encourage my students to talk like magpies in the chat the whole time I'm talking. And I know you're thinking, but they're not listening then. Well, you'd be surprised. I call it active listening. Did you know when I go to events, if I'm not typing in the text chat, I'm not paying attention to you. I'd, I'll apologize right now. But it's because if I'm on task, I'd let you know what I'm thinking. And I respond to you. And I'll get beyond 50%. I'll remember everything that, that I've typed because I have a kinesthetic memory. Even though we don't believe in learning styles anymore, right? <laughs> I st I'm still fond of mine. <laughs> but anyway, back to the scripting. So this is why we're doing this, OK? Our goals. As educators, we want to teach comfortably. And let's face it, if you're not a programmer, 
using scripts and trying to help students use them is kind of gruesome, isn't it? <laughs> we want to look good, and we don't want to feel embarrassed, right? It feels very uncomfortable to say, I don't know something, right? You're welcome, Peonia. And so um, uh, we want to share content, and we want to look good, and that's why we're here. How many of you have used Autoscript? Hey, someone clicked my box. Aren't you wonderful? Yeah, thanks, Ra. Uh, did you click it or do you just used it? <laughs> Who clicked the box, by the way? I should have left on the uh, thing that would that would let us know who clicked it. Great, Maggie. That's awesome. That's uh, in your thing, and it's called the scripting assistant, and it's just giving you the auto script. If you have not seen auto script, I'm gonna fly up to the sign. You, I'm gonna be Vanna White from Wheel of Fortune, right? <laughs> And here we go. Boom. You see this sign? I just want you to click it. You can look at it if you want, but if you click it, it loads a, a website. And I'll turn it for some of you because you'll notice it, it res and several people click. That's awesome. Okay? And we'll just raise that up. <laughs> One for everyone. And we could enlarge it. And, and of course, it's just a URL loader. So that's what that script is doing. You also have a copy of the sign in your book separately as well as inside the reser. What's interesting about the box underneath it, which you have, it's called Scripting Assistant, is it has the res script from Autoscript. So I'm going to grab this little sign for those of you who are not looking at browser. Okay, I'll bring it on over for a moment. I'll bring me to in just a moment. <laughs> And I'll enlarge it and I'll push it back. It's a little weird because here everything's a little off. So so um, everything's not centered or squared in case you're wondering. So I have to come at it with both the red and green arrows to, to organize content. But anyway, here we're looking at it. And this is a great way to get started with scripting if you've never created your own script before. Why? Because you don't have to write anything. You just have to be able to click two or three buttons. We can all do that. Maybe four. <laughs> At first, you have to think of the nine basic functions that you want your script to do. Do you want it to res an object? Well, that's what's happening back there in that box. When you clicked on it, it reses an object. It's not cleaning it up, though. We talk about that next week. And then um, give something to an avatar. We're actually going to look at that script today. And we're going to look at lots of different ways to give a note card, including giving a note card once, as well as giving contents to everyone. Uh, saying something in chat, uh, that's the most basic script, isn't it? When you create a new script, it instantly creates the Hello Avatar script, which you can always rename and repurpose to say other things, to greet people, right? Uh, my first digital assistant, I had it babbling. In fact, uh, in 2006, I created a Slani number no. five, which was a robot version of Johnny number no. five from Short Circuit. It was for the Lego Mindstorms and Wired Magazine uh, contest. Yeah, and it's part of my groups. It's called the Big Robot on Campus. And the reason I don't get rid of it, it was an electric sheep event in which we ran this contest and then we had a video and we had a big celebration at the end and and I created two bots for it and uh, I guess I could show you if you want to see them some of you have seen them and you go no no move on to the good stuff <laughs> but I'll uh, I'll res I'll res um, here's the drone Let's see if he flies here or if they have a fit and then here's the, um, well, I res them, and they're coming into being, so we'll see, right? Anyway, they look a little like short circuit, right? Looks like they're resing underground, so I'll just bring them up. Nothing fancy, but it was using, oops, this guy, it looks like I've cannibalized him or something. Let me grab a different one. The good news is I have tons of them, right? There we go. He's looking a little more normal. <laughs> Maybe a little huge, but this was one of the first. And when you click on him, each time you click on him, he does different things. That's the point here. And then, of course, I have um, a drone version. 
And I used the script from the drone version that I created, which is using the following uh, floating bobbing script, right? From Foolish. I always forget Foolish's last name, but um, I modified it because I didn't like it to bob too much. I'd get dizzy, right? <laughs> So when you click on these things, at first they give you a note card once. Uh, luckily they don't keep pelting you with note cards. The next time you click on them, they um, say something to the chat. So go ahead and click on them. Let's see if they work. It would be funny if I shut off their scripts. Okay. Well, if you got to go, And then, of course, I have lines from the movie, right? If you've never seen the movie Short Circuit, you keep clicking on them. And there's a, like a random number generator that's kind of cycling through them but I only put in maybe five or six lines so you'll notice um, and the lines are silly he's learning how to speak English and how to how to understand our culture by watching TV <laughs> so that's why you're seeing the silly silly things he's saying here but anyway the first time you click it no card the second time you start getting some statements etc I would give these to you but they made the textures and the objects, the base objects, no transfer, right? So, um, and then the original set for LEGO Mindstorms did not have axles or wheels. So that was my addition to the project. You'll notice I wanted Slani to move, right? And uh, even though he's too many prims to do it with physics, I put wheels and axles on him. I built them myself because they didn't have them in the original kit didn't know if you knew that and this was before the release of the Lego Mindstorms project just so you know so a lot of things we see in life and we see for education have actually had an introduction here in the virtual world first I didn't know if you knew that okay so I'll put the toys away right but um, I use the Slani bobbing one the drone behind me and I guess I'll walk around so you can see how he behaves he stays like a meter or two behind me and, and like a meter up or maybe it's three meters behind me and one up and of course he's phantom otherwise when he hits people he'd send them flying it'd be like a weapon right uh, <laughs> but the first time I moved a prim one meter into my body I catapulted to the next region so I learned early on in in 2005 2006 uh, to make things phantom <laughs> and of course I'm talking about the object being phantom now if anyone does not understand me, maybe I'm using terms that are unfamiliar, let me know. Okay? Okay, put up the toys. Um, so, and I'll leave um, the Slani Senior out here. I'll move him over to one side though. There we go. All right. And I'll reduce him in size. This is the joy of creating your own content. You notice he can become a little slony. He can go down to the, to the smallest size of the smallest little prim, right? So I often miniaturize my stuff, turn them into little floaters, use them as shoulder pets, or think about things that intrigue my students and pull them into the, the topic. Let's see, IMC says, I was a teacher for first leg. Oh, wonderful and taught making those robots wonderful yep well this was like um, I think we launched it in 2005 and we released um, the contest and the video in 2006 I used them also in a robotics class I taught in world about that time too it was a doctoral class and I only had three weeks to do the practical part where we were modeling bots right uh, the rest of it was, of course, uh, real-time systems um, and uh, uh, Pareto analyses. Anyway, so let me get back to my slides for a moment. So we have these nine behaviors, right? And then um, we would click on them, and then we would click, when do you want it to happen? And my recommendation as an educator and as someone who likes to give users control of their content I always select when an avatar touches it. I don't use the when they're nearby because you can't predict exactly how the simulator is going to behave. And when I first arrived here yesterday, the Vesuvius note card landed on me five times before I could get to the stage, which was only, what, five steps. 
So I thought, that's a lot of note cards, you know. <laughs> so, and of course, it was the world misbehaving, not the scripters and not the designers. Uh, but that happens. And so you want to be able to predict that and manage it for your students. Okay. So let's see, what else do I do? Well, um, I love the when someone says something, but that means you have a listener on an object, which means it has a little more memory. And if you have a congested region or if you have a lot of work going on, or let's say you have 40 students or 30 students, right? And you're thinking through, how do I get the most out of my space and give everyone an equal opportunity to create and have a certain number of prims and then also the scripting budget. That's what I call it, the scripting performance budget. And so I make students think about uh, conservation and environmental concerns to make sure that we're, we don't have lag and that we have a great experience. Okay, well let's um, let's look at a few examples. So I use this auto script, and I'm going to get rid of this sign. I'll just take it, and I created a few scripts that are hidden at the moment. I'm going to bring them out. You have them also, but let me give you a little history about auto script. Let's see. Here it was designed by Anne Enigma. How many of you know her? She ran virtual Morocco in 2006, 2005, and she taught uh, computer science classes. And she, uh, it's Hillary Mason, and um, we spoke together on a panel for the New Media Consortium. The New Media Consortium brought us into world, so they are responsible for us being here. And of course, Beth Cantor, Kantner has a, um, uh, an article with some images from it. Let's see. We arrived with the Educu Educational Use of Games Conference in 2005, and they released the campus in April 2006. And eventually, they grew to 90 regions. Uh, so there was the, what we called a university archipelago here in world. At one point, there were up to 400 universities in world, not just in conferences, but thinking about or offering activities, if not classes, in world. So that's important to note. That was by 2007. Our talk was leveraging the affordances and minimizing the barriers of immersive education. And at the time, I, I thought that was a little pompous, but now I realize how important it is, right? I tested Autoscript. And at the time, everything worked for me. Every once in a while, I have to tweak the script just a little bit. Like um, with the um, with the res script, I had to move it up a, an, another meter to get it to behave based on the rotation of my object. So that's something to think about. So when you use it, you go to threegreeneggs.com slash autoscript. And that site is so easy for me to remember, because I'm a Dr. Seuss fan threegreeneggs.com slash autoscript. But now you have the sign with it built in, right? You click on a menu option, then you click on when, when it should happen, and it generates a script that looks like this. Now there's really only one line of code there. All it says is uh, when someone touches it, and as soon as they touch it, it says touch start. You know when you touch on the mouse, or when you touch on your your cursor, whatever key you're using, maybe a touchpad. As soon as you depress it, it's going to execute this. That's what that means. Okay. Um, you know, in some software, you get to change your mind, don't you? You press the button, and if you, if you change your mind, you just move your hand off of it, right? But you keep the button depressed so it doesn't execute. <laughs> well, in this case, it's just going to happen. So. Um, but you notice that if all of us click it at the same time, it's not managing congestion for the simulator, is it? So some people will be serviced immediately, some later, and some they may have to ask for it again. So it's something to think of. Now, did you know, I don't know, can you guys all see that script? If not, um, you have a copy in your, in your folder as well. I suppose I should go grab another copy of the folder so I can easily look at it. There we go. So I just clicked on my book to get my folder open. And of course, a copy of this is um, the Give a Note Card uh, simple script. Okay? 
that's what it's called in your folder so if you wanted to look at it on your display rather than my signage you'll notice that um, the integer total number just means any number of times every time they click it just keep giving it okay <laughs> so they're not just getting it once you have that script too and it's from Slani in case you're wondering the give inventory detected key just says give them something and whatever their UUID is, whatever their key is, that avatar, any avatar gets it, okay? And then give whatever the inventory name is inside this, the contents of this object, and then the type is inventory underscore no card. If we wanted to give them a landmark, it'd be inventory underscore landmark, right? Now the number zero just means the first one. It's kind of like floors in Britain. You notice how there's a ground floor and then the first floor is one floor up? So if you wanted to give them two note cards, it's only going to give them the first note card that's in your object. So to give them two note cards, you copy that line and add the number one in place of inventory note card, comma zero, it would be comma one. I saw someone once do three of those. Now here's why that might not be a good idea. Does anyone know why it might not be a good idea? to put three note cards and three note card statements in your prim in your in your script any thoughts remember we welcome wrongness so be fearless right <laughs> you'll remember better well lag is one reason but imagine for a moment what happens when we create an object and you start getting note cards opening on your screen that's right you get them open on your screen often at least that's what happens to me so they hit you in the nose and let's say three of them hit you in the nose that's 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 the comical image that comes to mind for me when I think about my students yeah you start to get a little spam going and these days with an inventory of the size of mine and mine's uh, over 160,000 items it's it's not trivial okay yep 160 664 <laughs> anyway so um, and I deleted a lot too I, I tell you but um, so the folder thing the difficulty with it I love it too Maggie and I use it all the time in fact that came from Yadni uh, Mund uh, who did the junkyard remember Yadni's junkyard it was such a staple here in world for over 12 years it's gone now I hear yep that's right but uh, and Yadni's doing other things, but he's still still active and still has his blog and his stuff. But um, his script only gave it to the owner, so you would have to buy his object. Remember, often for one linden, and then you'd um, res your box, and then you'd have to open everything up, and then it only worked for you, the owner. So if other people clicked your box, they couldn't get a copy. Well, that disturbed me. I like to share, right? <laughs> so I had to change it from give to, to, to get owner to detected key so everyone could use it, right? And then I had to take out his little check to make sure if it's not the owner, you know, tell them they go get their own, you know. <laughs> and then, of course, I love to whisper to people. But when you whisper to people from a prim, it does it in the local chat but it's an LL instant message that's the function and what it's doing it, it is a little costly for the simulator but not bad have you ever given money at an event or done something and it announced to everyone what you did and if you if you didn't have a lot of money it made you feel embarrassed right or if you gave a lot of money that might have made you feel embarrassed too right <laughs> so there's something about privacy and feeling like you can interact with objects and feel comfortable. So that's really the next point I'm, I'm illustrating here is we think through not just ha the fact that we want to share but how people feel about the sharing and whether they feel comfortable and you feel comfortable so that you can get on to the mission of teaching right and and feeling like you have this great experience. So. I don't really do the multiple, I don't even do one note card. You notice I don't even have an example for you. I could make one real quick. In fact, maybe I should. Maybe that's the right kind of demo. We'll create a box. I'm sorry, um, I should turn on build privileges for you guys because we, we could uh, 
I actually have them on the other region. Next week we're going to be building, okay? So um, we'll just wait and do it then. I don't own this region, that's why. <laughs> in case you're wondering. But here, I'll put this in here, and I'm going to give you my, my little, uh, this is not an informative note card, and I'm going to change this to click me. <laughs> and of course, uh, you can, uh, I better reset the scripts, right? Once you drop a script in something, on the content tab, you want to click the reset scripts. And here you go. Go ahead and click my objects. And you'll notice he just gives you a note card. Now if I repeated that, that line of code and I up the number from 0 to 1 to 2 to 3, and kept, it'll keep giving note cards, right? If there aren't note cards in there, it'll give errors, right? And of course, for folks who are seeing script errors, that can be very annoying. So you always want to want to watch that. Any questions so far? Let's get to some fun stuff, right? Okay, the, the, the script behaviors I'm going to talk about, and I'm looking at my time, are give a note card. That's what we've started. And of course, we just talked about giving more than one note card. You can do it. You could even give a note card and a landmark in the same script. You just copy that line and say inventory underscore landmark or inventory underscore texture, right? So you have control of your content. You're no longer relying on using someone else's script. You're now the creator of that script. That's a really powerful thought. Now with the um, auto script, she, you'll notice she, at the top of it, she had that little, bring it back up here. She had that little thing, if you scroll in close, that has the disclaimer and gives credit to her and her site for auto-generating it. That way others can go find it and that way we can, um, so when I tailor someone's script, I add another comment, and comments are that slash slash space whatever you say, right? I'll add another comment that'll say Lear Lobo was here, right? <laughs> and, and the changes I made or the date or whatever, right? Okay. I'm going to make this box invisible unless we and, and, and see if we need it again, right? And so I just set it to 100% transparent because I love photos. Have you noticed that? And I love not having too much signage or floating text or whatever with my photos. So now, give a note card once. You have it in your folder. If you double click it, it's called Give a Note Card Once, and it's from Slani. So I have a couple scripts in Slani, and Connie Kemba and I wrote it. And I, I tailored how it behaves, and I asked him to write it for me. We were working on this project, and I was doing all the bot stuff and the, the movement stuff, right? And then I also did the, um, the sayings that are in it. But for this one, you'll notice there's no state entry. You guys notice that? If you go down to line 18, and I know some of you are going, let me see if I have an image of this. I'll make my um, viewer transparent for a moment, right? And then, let me see what I have behind it. All right, let's see. That's the give contents to anyone. Let's see what this is. Oh, that's someone else's stuff, right? Better not mess with that. Always turn on transparency before you go undoing other people's transparency. <laughs> Let me see what this one is. I may not have done a, a sign for give a give con give it once. So let me um let me put it on there. Let's see. Well, I may not have made a made a sign for it, so we will just look at the script, right? Can anyone not see the script in your folder? And if you're new, click on my book to get your folder. I'll move forward so you can see the book. <laughs> anyway, what's happening here is we have this variable. The global variable is a list, and it's called before. And it's looking to see if someone's clicked it before. That's what it means. The default, there's no state entry, which means, are the lights on or off? If you think about the starting state of a script, you're really thinking about when it comes into being or it gets reset, 
what is it like? What does it know? It's like moving into a room. Are the lights on or off, right? What's, what's the starting state? And so you select one that makes sense, right? At this point, it's never given an object. That's the starting state. So it has no starting state. And when you do a touch start, it creates a little list. And it says, have they, have they clicked it before? And it, the detected key is the person, right? And the minus one is nope. And then, of course, um, so it's testing to see that. You notice that equals equals means, is the left side and the right side true or false? Are they the same? Has, have they not clicked it? If they're not clicked it, we'll give them a copy. And if they have, you know that before plus equals just means we're going to add one to it, right? <laughs> and so the next time it goes through this, or they touch it again, it's going to say, nope, they already have one. <laughs> And so let me put that script on the box. I have to bring the box back, right? Here we go. And I am looking at the time, because we do have one more to cover. So I'm deleting the old script. I'm going to put in the give a note card once. Okay, I reset it. Now go ahead and, and I'll enlarge it just in case I'm a little too close to it and it's hard for you to see. So it's this big, and of course I use color a lot so students know which box are you talking about. There's only like three of them here. <laughs> the big red box in front of me. Try clicking that twice. Now I didn't put a little comment in there and I could have that said the second time you click it, it says, oops, you already have one. <laughs> But I could if I was being kind. But in this case, they only get it once. Now, if I reset it, they'll get it again. Or if I res it for a new class, they'll get it. So, so I just change the contents of the box. And, and the next week, the next lesson, I'm ready to go again, right? And that way, people aren't being spanned with too much content. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. If 20 people click it all at once, Will it, will it remember that they're on the list and not, uh, not give them the content? That's always possible. This works best if people are clicking it individually, right, and at different times. Like maybe they're coming by your exhibits or picking up asynchronous class materials, etc. right? But that's a fun, fun script. So uh, I'll just sync the box a little bit this time instead of getting rid of it. And we'll move on to the next. No questions? You guys are good? All right. So let me move that out of the way. And bring back the slides. I'm just making them 100% transparent so that we can see what we're doing, right? So we're directing students' attention, in this case yours, to the content. Oh, it says final thoughts, but we're not quite done yet. But, but uh, let's look at those, and then we'll look at the give contents to anyone. That's my favorite. Final thoughts are scripts are like recipes. The ingredients go first. That makes them global, which means all of the functions, resources, methods, or whatever is underneath the script, depending on the language you're looking at, can use them. Right? If you declare them later on, they're only useful for that function or for that method. So it's good to know so you can expect their behavior. Right? We know how recipes work. That's not so hard. And when you think algorithmically, you can use things like AutoScript to create your basic behaviors. Then you can use other scripts written by others to, to learn additional functions to make them a little cooler, right? There is this notion of memory. So we don't put everything in there but the kitchen sink. You'll notice my scripts tend to be fairly lean. It's not because I'm using AutoScript. They're lean even when I write them. <laughs> And then the last, how many of you use floating text? You'll notice my book is not showing any floating text. I'm going to turn it on. So I'm going to activate my um, give contents to anyone script that's in this. And it does not give itself, by the way. So have you noticed um, my scripts never give a copy of themselves to the person who's clicking on it? So I'm going to un. Let's see, where is it? Here it is. Okay. 
I'll show you an example of what I mean. All right. So right now, I probably faded it down to zero, zero, and I did. <laughs> I do this fade thing, which is the last set of numbers. So let me, let me um, untransparent. You'll notice there's flooding text above my book right now. Okay. Let me move the slides back and bring forth the script that that I find is very cool. And I use it for lots of different things, not just for giving contents to everybody. There's quite a few principles in here I reuse and repurpose. Now, I hope you can see that. I know it's blurry. That's the problem with 512 textures when you bring them in, is they're just not as crisp as, as they were when I created them. But this keeps it legal in case you're resing on a sandbox or at an event where they where they say your textures cannot be larger than 512, right? <laughs> so what we're looking at is over here on line 25, um, where it says string folder name, That's that it, it's grabbing the object name. So if I want your folder to be called something different, I have to rename my book, don't I? Yep, you bet. Good. <laughs> it should be. And then um, you'll notice on line 18, I'm resetting the script just in case something went awry when it res, right? <laughs> And then, uh, so so it has an on res function. When I res it, when I drag it to the ground, reset it, make sure everything's crisp and fresh. That's just grabbing the object name again, in case you're wondering. Okay. Uh, so that becomes the name of the folder it gives. The state entry, of course, is checking it to make sure we haven't made any changes, right? The third thing I'm doing is line 31. You see how it's a comment? It's right above my head, by the way. Uh, let me let me put my head there, right? <laughs> I forgot to create a pointer, so I'll use me, right? Uh, 31, it says uh, slash slash, which means it's a comment, and anything in red is a comment. I'll comment out code when I don't want it to, to work, and then uncomment it when I'm ready for it, okay? You'll notice at the very end of that line, it says 0, 0.0. What that means is it'll never show up because it, it'll have no... Um, it, it's faded all the way down to 100% to transparency. So to get that to work, I not only have to uncomment it, but I have to turn 0.0, .0 at the very end of the line. And we're on line 31, by the way. I have to make it 1.0, right? Uh, to make it bright is what you're seeing right now. Now I want you to pull back with your with your scroll wheel and then pull forward again. And you notice that when you pull back far enough, my script is the um, the floating text disappears, right? You see that? Everyone good with that? I'm checking the chat. Okay, great. So now let's take a look what happens when I make it 0 0.4, which is my favorite. And it's only because I like to take photos. And I don't want to see floating text when I take them, right? So let's see, give contents to anyone. I've got to open the script again. <laughs> and of course, go down to line 31, and I'm just going to make it 0 0.4 at the end. Now, of course, I can change colors. The colors, the, that vector is our red, green, and blue, right? So if I want lots of red, I say 1.0 and then 0, 0 after it, right? For lots of red, no green, no blue. Notice it's, it's faint now, isn't it? And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, how will students ever see that? They have to get close. When they pull back, it fades out a little faster. And it also is not too discordant. Now, I'll, I'll color it if I have to, especially if I'm doing a volcano, right? I might do a little red and a little green or something and try to get to an orangey color somehow <laughs> and, and create effect. Anyway, just something. So to get rid of this, though, how many of you have a script called the Scrubber? And yes, we're about to wrap up. Anyone have the Scrubber? Yeah. The Scrubber is important because if I delete a script that has um, floating text, the floating text does not go away. Have you noticed that? I'm going to give you guys a copy of this. And of course, um, I'll just share it with everyone near me. And if you have it, you can just delete it, right? 
sudden the world comes to a halt. Have you noticed? I'm sorry. When you share like that, all of a sudden the world comes to a halt. Have you noticed? The simulator's like thinking about it. It's going, oh my gosh, what'd she just do? And of course, if you have a large inventory like I do, you pause and you go, will I crash? Will I crash? <laughs> I don't know if you guys knew this, but almost every time I get a note card like that, it's almost a crash moment. The screen goes dark and, and, and the world wavers for me. So I think about that before I give it to you. You notice I only do it at the end, right? <laughs> But anyway, uh, here's what's happening in this cool little script. Okay, when it actually begins, we're at touch start up there at the top right, right on 35. And you notice it says integer total number, which means anytime you touch me, you're getting a copy of these fo uh, contents. And then of course uh, the list, it's creating a list of all the contents in your contents folder of an object. So. Let's see. I hope it is because I want you guys to feel powerful, to feel like your scripts are not leading you, but you understand them, even if you haven't written them, and you can uh, do things with them. So let me see. Let me grab something, an example here. I'm going to grab this book I have. And by the way, did you know how big this book was for um, for SL? Um, the, the one of their birthdays. I think it was the 13th or, or 12th birthday when I featured it. I see my book keeps going underground. It, this is the book where I'm wearing, right? It has contents. I'm resing it so you can peek inside my book. It was actually about nine meters tall and I actually had a script on it that was a dumpster dive script so you could jump into my book and pull out a dream. <laughs> That was my theme for the um, for the second life birthday is what are our dreams, right? So I want you to peek inside my book. I just right click it and say edit and I'm going to um, I've shared it with the Vesuvius group. I had to because otherwise the book would disappear, right? Because uh, that so so of course when you look in the contents you might be able to see them, but you can't do much with them, right? So what you're doing is you're editing my book, right click and edit it, it's this big thing on top of my body, right? And then, <laughs> and then click the content tab. It's way over on the right, about a third down. If you do not see what I'm talking about, let me know. Everyone see it? Give me a, I don't see it or no if you don't, okay? Because I don't mean to overwork you, right? All good? Good. Okay, great. We're all great. Wonderful. And if you have a minimized um, edit menu, just click the more or the uh, little down arrow to make it large. Well, what I'm talking about here is when we have all these contents inside of it, it's building a list of them. So if I drag new contents into it, the script, uh, I want to reset the script either by re-resing it or clicking the reset scripts button that's also under the content tab right so it rebuilds this list I'll move my book over to one side now that you're looking at it and you can see up here on the um, we're looking at lines 37 through 41 and so it's it's giving it a name and it's thinking about the number of items you know and all that and then it's not going to give itself You'll notice down there on line 49, it says to delete the script instead of giving it. So, so that's a handy little way of, of saying, no, no, we build the list, but now this, this item here, we're not going to include. <laughs> and then um, it, it does look at the link that makes sure it gives everything. Uh, when you get down to 58, the give inventory list and detected key is when it actually gives it, right? And then it, it assigns the folder name, which is the object's name, right? and then all the contents goes in. Then on 61, it sends everyone a little message privately. That's what instant message does. And of course, it does it to that detected key, which is that avatar. Look in your inventory for a folder called blah. So if for your classes, you wanted that line to say something different, this is why I'm pointing it out. You could say for you know, for for my liberal arts class, or for my Spanish learning class, or for 
or you could make it mysterious. It could be for Halloween or for some event or for Christmas or for whatever, right? For whatever event, and you could use an event saying there. And then, of course, um, you always want to let them know where their folder is also, but you can, you can have some fun with these sayings is what I'm saying. Now, you'll notice it also says plus folder name plus, and there's spaces um, after the, everything that's in the quotes are text that's going to appear in the chat log. The folder name's going to appear too. So we have to put in a little spacing so it's not all clumped together, right? You'll notice in a script, I can keep writing on subsequent lines and it's still part of the same executable line until it gets to that semicolon at the end. Syntax matters. It's just like English. If we don't, um, if we don't have punctuation, uh, and we write like E.E. E. Cummings, who wrote all in small case. Some of our people will understand, but programs get a little testy, right? They like things to be um, case sensitive, and they like their syntax. <laughs> they like their punctuation. All those curly braces are just logical ways of grouping things. Like line 57 and line 63 is one group, right? So it's all grouped together, and all that's going to happen. And it only happens if um, you know the contents list is less than one. If, it, if we're not empty yet, keep giving the stuff, and then let them know uh, what they got, right? And then I want to say thanks to Yadni Mond, who came up with with Seagal. He came up with the original script, but it had a few differences. Like I said, it gave only to the owner, right? And then of course it did a lot of error checking which had some overhead that I just didn't need. Well, that's been a quick look, a very quick look, and all we did was give contents to people, right? <laughs> but now we have also have a little sense of scripting behavior. Next week, and I think I scheduled it an hour later, so you have to let me know if that's not a good time, but the reason I did it was to make sure I was a little more alert, right? Because um, I am a night person. <laughs> I teach nights and work nights, but um, yeah, so having me awake is kind of handy, right? But uh, we're going to actually get a res kit, so you're going to get a holodeck reser that I use for my classes. I'm going to talk about how we curate student projects by making them resible and putting them on the reser, so that way you have a whole class worth of work archived on a single device, right? Third, we're going to look at how to take some balls and create a resible event ourselves. So you're going to create something that reses, and it, you're going to create a button, and it's going to go in your menu. We're going to try to do all of this in one hour. <laughs> and we're going to do it on a different region. It's going to be called sudo, and if you don't mind, I'm going to give you a copy of the landmark for it, so you're all set. But it's also in the in the region stuff. But it's kind of nice to know where we're going, right? So get ready for. Well, we could take an hour and a half, Luke's. You know how I am. You're going to play a little bit, so you might want to play and try a few things. And I do have examples for you too that are going to be in it. <laughs> so you're going to get a bunch of fun stuff, including something I won a second prize for at Game Tech. Um, it was um, my how to, um, you know, how to learn to design intermediate skills using a single prim. Remember that tube becomes a lamp, a fountain, and a stool. Yeah, we'll do that. It's it's on there already for you. So let me give you the landmark, and it has all the educational materials too. Now, any questions for me? See, I learned from my mistakes early in life. For the ACRL, the, the Association of College Research Librarians, I gave a talk once and thought I had an hour and a half, and I only had an hour, right? So they were like seriously distressed <laughs> when I just kept talking. Uh, and I was so happy, right? <laughs> so I've learned to keep it brief, focused. Now, all the signage behind me, you have a copy of it in your folder. So that's what those script signs look like. They look like this. Okay? So I'm going to clean up. And uh, yeah, the book is a little easier to read large, right? <laughs> that is funny. 
I didn't give you guys the textures for it because I don't remember where I put them. That was so three years ago, right? But um, you do have the slides. And I'll try to remember to get them in the Chilbo area, Maggie and, and Nelly. And I want to thank everyone for coming and for being very patient. Oh, I created this yesterday. <laughs> You're welcome. And the first version I gave, if you'd like a copy of it too, it had some cool pose ball stuff and typing at a computer and all that. Let me res that for you. It works on the same principle, except I use my Slani script. Let me see if it's going to come join me or not. Let me get rid of the book. Let me res it. Here it is. If you click on this book, it will give you a bunch of scripts in addition to what you got. It will also give you um, some animations and pose balls, how to create your own pose ball and how to do various stuff. Yep. Hey, and I'm even legal. The reason it will say no copy on it when you get it is because the animations from Bits and Bobs and I don't have the digital rights on it. I have the rights to distribute one copy per thing I sell or use in my workshops. But I don't, uh, you have to click on it several times if you want another one copy. But <laughs> and you're welcome. I love the typing at a computer thing. You're welcome. And it may be giving you the follower facing bobbing script. I can't remember if I put that to not give or not. I think I did. I think I have it broken out separately. It's called Air Lobel's Magical Assistant, I'm sure. <laughs> but then you can have your own magical assistant. You just change whether it's going to be in front of your face, behind you. Just change the vector so it floats where you want it. Okay. And then, of course, when you have yours, it doesn't have the book inside, I don't think. Might, but I don't think so. Um, you can change the size. <laughs> you don't have to have a monster book in front of your face. I made it large so people could easily reach it, right? That's right. That's good, though. That's the way it should be. That's the difference and the, and the benefit of a virtual world experience over a meeting in a, in a web conferencing tool in Moodle or somewhere else, all of those have their strengths because you can talk, you're empowered, and, and you have time to think about your words. But the difficulty is we can't share all this cool content quite that easily. I'm still cleaning up. <laughs> Let me know if you need anything. I'm Lear Lobo, and I will see you next week. We we'll also have an event on Saturday, the World of Warcraft. It does take about 52 gigabytes of, of storage space to download the game, but you can play for free to level 20 and join us for an educational event looking at WoW in school and how we teach using commercial games. This is the Virtual World uh, Massive Open Online Course and uh, Multi-User Online Course, and the notion here is that we meet in so many different virtual worlds and we learn everywhere. We have educator guilds, and you're welcome to join us. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Eugenia. Thanks, Bethany, Maggie, Torgon, Ed Agile Bill, IMC, Peonia. I'm so glad you joined us. We have Nellie and Luke. So I met Luke last year at the MOOC. Stranger, thank you for coming. Frederick. I don't know that we, we're not friends. If you want to be friends, let me know. D delightful, good to see you. She's my research partner in crime. Uh, we're in virtual harmony together. <laughs> Dave and Ra, thank you for all the wonderful answers. And Burdex, Burdex Jaeger. And then, of course, Bethany. If I missed anyone, let me know. And thanks. <laughs> thanks.
so much, Leah. We'll see you soon. Sounds great. See, some of you on Saturday, we will have a Discord channel and a YouTube live stream for those of you who don't want to play but want to see how it works. Okay? The time is noon Second Life time. At first, we had 5 p.m. on it, but um, we were trying to hit the most time zones so that the Euro European folks wouldn't be in bed, right? Yet. <laughs> but unfortunately. <laughs> okay, great. Unfortunately, it's difficult for Australia, right? Because that's like two or three in the morning for New Zealand, particularly, and then Hong Kong's a little later. But 